Well, today we're continuing in our series called Renewal uh, out of the book of Malachi. And what I love about the book of Malachi, if you haven't already seen this uh, from the first week we went through this, is the word Malachi essentially means messenger. And so what we're going to see in, in this whole book of Malachi is it's God's words to his people. God's words to us. If you guys ever asked this question, I wish God would just speak to me. Has anybody ever dared to ask that? Yeah, I see some hands. God, I wish you would just speak to me. Just tell me what it is I need to hear. You know, like in an old TV show, I'm hearkening back to where the, the light would appear and a voice from heaven would speak. You ever watch Touched by an Angel? Anybody ever watch that show? All right, the light would appear, God would speak, and just tell you exactly what you need to hear. But I think as, as what you'll see today as we look at Malachi and through this whole series is, is if God were to really speak to you, you may not like what he has to say. If he were to speak directly to you and say exactly what you need to hear, it may not be the easiest thing for you to hear. And just listen to the message today and you may change your mind on whether or not you want God to speak directly to you. Our big idea today is this, God gave his best. God deserves our best because he gave his best. God deserves our best because he gave his best, which we just saw an awesome picture of that in that object lesson. And we're going to be on page 669 in the chair Bibles. We're going to be in Malachi chapter 1. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, you, f- you can feel free to use our chair Bibles. If you don't have one at home or one in a translation that you understand, you are welcome to take that one home with you as our gift to you today. We'll have it on the screens. You can follow along in the app. There's notes in the program. Lots of different ways to engage with the message today. So let's just jump right in because in a minute you're going to start to smell burgers cooking. And I know once that starts, I have a limited amount of time with your attention. So let's start here in verse 6 of Malachi chapter 1. A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I am your father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty? It is your priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? We're going to stop there. And what I love about Malachi is we've already kind of just, you know, just talked about how it's words from God is God doesn't pull any punches here. He doesn't hold back. He, he just speaks directly to the point. He just lays it on the line. And, and the question here, God begins with this question of verse 6. It's, where is the honor due me? Where is the honor due me? And this question of honor is going to frame uh, the rest of what we're going to talk about today. This question of, where is the honor due me? And, and, and as we start, I want us to start with this thought. What we choose to honor will get our best. Whatever it is that you or I choose to honor in our life, will ultimately get our best. In the original Hebrew, that word honor means to literally be heavy. Something is heavy, it's of weight. And so someone that we honor is someone that we treat as a heavyweight in our life. Someone of utmost importance. So the question for us as we walk through this is, what are we giving our best to? What are we giving our best to? What is it that we are honoring? Or another way we could say this is, what do we worship? What is getting our worship? What we view as most important, of of greatest significance, will get our best. We'll receive our honor and our worship. And in 1 Corinthians 10.31, which is going to be the verse we're going to memorize this week, it says this. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So God answers this question of honor, where is the honor due me, by revealing that it's the priests who have been showing contempt for his name. It was the priests who were not honoring him in the way that they were sacrificing to him. When we don't honor someone, we're at best indifferent towards them, or at worst, contempt. And so I thought it'd be fun just for a second to talk about this word contempt. And for us to think about who are some of the people that we show contempt towards. And I don't want you to answer that. That's a rhetorical question, okay, because they may be in the room. But who are some of those people that we show contempt towards? Anybody a sports fan? Where are my sports fans at? Awesome, awesome. Well, in sports, uh, you know, you're going to have your favorite teams, and, and inevitably those teams have rival teams. Or other teams that if you were to even think about Rooting for that team, it would like turn your stomach. If you're a Huskies fan, it's the Oregon Ducks, right? Yeah, we're getting there. If you're a Seahawks fan, 
It used to be the 49ers. I don't know who it is anymore. I just feel bad for them, right? I mean, I don't know who. But, you know, there, there's those teams that the thought of it just turns to somebody. That's contempt for kids. My kid's in the room. Who are those people, don't answer this, that no matter what they do, they annoy you to death? It's probably a sibling, right? It's probably that's what you're thinking of. It's like a sibling or a best friend. People that just annoy you no matter what they do. And for some of us, we're picky eaters. Anybody a picky eater? Like, you, you know, there's certain foods you like and you don't like. Content is a way that you turn your nose up at Brussels sprouts, at pickled herring, at fruitcake, Right? Or, you know, if there's a veggie platter today at the barbecue, it's how I will look at that veggie platter. Or just things that we turn our nose up and say, you know, I just don't want anything to do with that. It's worthless. It's meaningless to me. And that's what contempt is. And God is saying that this was the way that the priests were treating him. This sense of worthless, this thought of turning your stomach, it has no importance. Couldn't imagine ever devoting any time or energy to that. And God's saying, this is the way that you're treating me. And this accusation wasn't just pointed at anybody. This was pointed at the priests, who were the spiritual leaders of Israel. If anybody should have been close to God, should have had this in or figured out what it meant to honor God, it should have been these people, and yet God is saying, everything that you're doing is worthless to me. And if this is the condition of the spiritual leaders, you can imagine the condition of the people as well, who they were leading. And so God says, you're showing contempt for my name. And their response, I think, is so typical of us. When we are ever accused of something that is insulting, that's out of left field, like, what do you mean? Our first response, I always say, hey, listen, what did I do? Like, come on now, what did I do? Are you serious? And that's as they said, they said, well, how have we shown contempt for your name? They were completely ignorant to the contempt that they were showing towards God for his name. They, they didn't even see it. They didn't even understand, like, how in the world is this God? What are you saying? And so God begins to clue them in on the ways that they are showing contempt for his name. So let's continue reading in verse 7. This first 6 ends with, How have we shown contempt for your name? God continues in verse 7, By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, How have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now plead with God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty. So defiled sacrifices were sacrifices that were not right or ritually clean or acceptable as the law required. And the law was something God gave the Israelites as they left captivity in Egypt. And he brought them back to this mountain where he said, I'm going to define you as my people. and I'm going to lay out what it means to follow me. And he gave them clear guidelines of what it meant to worship him, to honor him. In fact, it says in Leviticus 22, which was part of the law that they were given, it says, um, it says this, do not bring anything with defect because it will not be accepted on your behalf. Don't bring anything with a defect. It's not going to be accepted. God was very clear. This is what is required. This is what he wants from them. And yet they were offering him something less. By sacrificing these leftover offerings, they were re revealing just how little they valued God. He wasn't worthy of the best they had to offer. He was given whatever was left, that which wasn't desirable to them. That's, God was just given whatever was left at the end of the day after they had taken what they wanted. Here, God, here's what's left. If I have anything, I'll give it to you. And here's another thought. We honor best what we value most. Whatever it is that we, we honor best, we will value that the most. And just a few weeks ago, my wife and I celebrated our 11-year anniversary. And, and so we decided, you know, like you would do for any anniversary, get dressed up, hire a babysitter, and go out to a nice dinner to celebrate and honor our marriage. Well, what if instead of taking my wife to a nice dinner, which I did, so just before I set this up, just know, took her to a nice dinner, I promise. I got pictures to prove it. What if I took her to the Costco food court? <laughs> which... Which, hear me out, is a high-class dining experience, in my opinion. Because not only do you get your meal, but you can walk around and get the multiple courses. Come on now, this is a multiple course dinner. Come on now, it's, it's not, 
I'm selling it to myself right now. <laughs> but what if I chose to honor our wedding anniversary that way when I could have afforded something greater? You know, if that's all you can afford, that's fine. But if, if I could have afforded something greater, but I said, no, I'm going to take you here instead. I'm going to offer the least common denominator, the fifty hot dog. What would that speak? What would that speak to my wife of, her, of, of the value and worth of our marriage? Yes, it would have been cheaper. A lot cheaper. <laughs> but at what cost? At what cost to her heart and her sense of worth? When we choose to give God less than our best, what value does that ascribe to him? When we say, God, I, I, I could offer more, but I'm only going to offer this. What value does that ascribe to him? And let's just, let's just kind of expand our, our view for a second here and just think about the people around us that know we follow Jesus. For those that follow Jesus, and if they see us treating him that way, what value to them does that speak of who God is in our life? Not just to ourselves, but to those around us. What, what value does that say of who God is in our life? If we just give him what's left, we just give him what's left over. Proverbs 3.9 says this, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all you produce. I love the example that God gives in verse 8. He says, Try giving this kind of offering to your governor. Would he accept that? And the answer to that rhetorical question is no, right? That's not going to fly. They see, and God's saying, yeah, you treat me this way. I mean, if we tried that, we would find ourselves in verse 9, which said, now plead with God to be gracious with us. Plead with the governor to be gracious with you. If that's the kind of offering you're going to give, you better plead for mercy and grace, because it is not your best. It is not what he requires of you. Let's keep reading in verse 10, because it's going to get better, I promise. Not really, but it's going to get better. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors, so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. So God has been asking question on top of question, and now we get to this place where he gives us direct command. Just stop. Just lock the doors. Because what you're doing doesn't mean anything. You're lighting useless fires. You're going through motions, but it doesn't mean anything. See, God wasn't, God just didn't want the sacrifice. He wasn't just about the rule. He wanted their hearts. It was about something much greater, something much deeper than just a sacrifice. In Isaiah 29, 13 it says this, I got this on the screen. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. This is another prophet speaking about the people of Israel saying, listen, their, their lips and their, they honor me with what they say. They do the right things, but their heart is far from me. God is after something much greater than sacrifice. He isn't interested in religion. Rules for rules sake. Every rule, every sacrifice was meant for us to see how broken we are without him. To bring us to a place where we recognize just how much we need God. To bring us into right relationship with him. Not right religion with him. You see at the base level when we talk about honor and not honoring God, honor is a heart issue. The very base level. The issue of honor is the issue of our hearts. God wants our best because he wants our hearts. He knows that our, our honor, our worship is tied to our hearts. And he is longing for our hearts to be close to him. And so for those kids in the room, where are my kids at again? Stick with me. I'm almost done. Come on now. All right. Have you ever had to apologize for something that you didn't think you did wrong? Is anybody, kids, you, okay, yes, that's, I love their honesty, right? Sometimes your parents ask you to apologize for something you, you didn't feel was wrong. And they say, you need to apologize for that. Why? Because it's not just about the apology. It's about your view of others and your heart for God. It's about your heart. And for us bigger kids, 
a lot of times we come to church just to kind of check off the proverbial church box, like just to check that off for a week. Okay, I got that in. We work hard all week. We play hard on the weekends, and sometimes we come into church 15 minutes late hoping the speaker doesn't go long. And that's what we give God. Say, oh, well, I made it. I checked the box. So listen, God isn't, he's not concerned about you being here. He's concerned about your heart. Now, your heart's going to grow here because you're surrounding yourself with people that are going to pour into you. It's about your heart. Worship isn't one day a week. It's, it's a life of honoring God. It's not just about coming here and then, all right, now I can go back to my life. No, this, this is what, honoring God is, is your life. It's all that you are. It's about your heart. Let's keep reading in verses 11 through 14. He said, My name will be great among the nations, from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you profane it by saying, The Lord's table is defiled, and his food is contemptible. You say, What a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord. Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. That's powerful stuff. What God is saying is like in the midst of Israel's lack of honor, what he's saying is, listen, I want you to know that my name will be great among the nations. He didn't need them in order to receive honor. And I think in some way he was pointing forward to what would happen with Jesus to where now we are all grafted in and able to worship. But the sense of like, you know, God doesn't need you in order to receive honor and glory. And that was mind-blowing. This, this idea was mind-blowing for the people in Malachi's time because as far back as they knew, God was their God. He was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which was their forefathers. He was the God of Israel. It was their identity, was God, and, and he was tied to them. There was a special set-apart relationship. And God is saying, listen, I don't need you in order to be honored. They had grown to this spot of familiarity with God. There's an old phrase, I think, that holds so much truth. Familiarity breeds content. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but it seems that the people that are closest to us can annoy us the most, right? But even on a deeper level, and this is the hard thing, is the people that are closest to us can also hurt us the most. The greatest wounds typically come from those that are closest to us. And this is how Israel interacts with God. They had grown so accustomed to God being with them that they had slowly backed into a place of utter contempt towards him. So familiar with God being their God that this relationship had drifted to a place where they just viewed him as as part of what they did, but he had no value to them. And God here shares some examples of the ways that they showed contempt towards him. They looked at offerings to God as a burden. We have to do this. You, you sniff at it and say, oh, what a burden. They brought leftover animals for sacrifice. They didn't bring the first, the best. They brought whatever was left. They lied about what they were offering in order to look acceptable. They, you say, curse is the cheat who says, I will bring the best, but then turns around, and although we vowed, bring something less than. And it's easy for us to look at them and say, wow, And that was really messed up, but let's kind of point it back at us for a second, because I think this is also for us. Are there ways that we show contempt? For those that say, I'm following Jesus, are there ways that we've grown so familiar in our relationship with him that it's it's become a contemptuous relationship? Here's some examples. Do we look at following Jesus as a burden? Sometimes like there's just so many rules, or I can't do this, I can't do that. Oh, this is so much work. Do we bring Jesus our leftovers? Are we offering leftovers? When God wants our best, do we just sort of give him the leftovers of our week, of our time, of our finances, of our gifts and talents? Do we talk one way on Sunday but live a completely different life Monday through Saturday? 
we come and we, we vow and we speak these things here, but as soon as we leave this place, we're a completely different person. God deserves our best. He's worthy of our honor and our worship. Why? Well, let's go back to our big idea. Because he gave his best for us. God deserves our best because he gave his best for us. And I know sometimes we hear that phrase, uh, it's easy to think of it like this. Like, because God did all these things for me, I have to now somehow try to earn back what he has offered to me. I have to, I have to give him my best, and hopefully my best is good enough to deserve what he did for me. The sense of, like, I have, to, I have to work hard, I have to be a good person, I have to do these right things, and if I check enough boxes, if I do enough, if I give enough in the offering, maybe somehow I can be worthy of what Jesus did for me. I can earn that. If you're living in that place, let me just tell you, it's going to lead to discouragement. It will always lead you to discouragement, because what in the world can I offer to a God that is perfect, just, Holy. What in the world can I offer him that he doesn't already have? All right? He says he, can, he, he will get his honor whether I honor him or not. Like, what in the world can I bring to him? You'll find yourself in a place of discouragement if that's your approach. Kids, have you ever made a mess so big that you couldn't clean it up? Be honest. Oh, I love it. Adults, <laughs> you involved in right? Yeah, come on now. We've made messes bigger than we can clean up. Well, my son Judah, he's five, and, and so he's at the age now where Legos are really cool. And not like the big Legos that you see, but like the tiny Legos that plant themselves like landmines in your carpet. You know what I mean? And he's got this huge tub of Legos, and he loves to play with them. He'll get them out, and his sister, who's three, uh, you know, generally when they play in his room with the Legos, somehow all thousand plus of those things will find their way under the floor. Uh, strewn about the room. I don't know how it happens. It just does. And I just know when it's time to clean up, uh, I know it's going to happen because it happens every time. I say, okay, Judah, it's time to clean your room. He begin to clean his room, and at some point, I can see it in his eyes and his face. This is too big for him. His shoulders start to slump. He starts to, you know, get teary-eyed. He says, Dad, I just can't do this. He says, Dad, unless, unless you help me, I, I can't. He says, I'm going to go really slow. That's his, I said, great, go slow. I don't care. You know, like, but he thinks he's outsmarting me. But he's like, I'm, I just can't, if you can't help me, I can't do this. And as much as it's my right to say, son, you made the mess, clean it up. My heart as a dad can't leave him like that. So at some point, I have to swoop in. I get to. I'm father, I get to swoop in. Help him clean up the mess he can never clean up on his own. Help him pick up the Legos. And you see his whole attitude, his countenance changed because suddenly dad is with me. Dad is doing what I could not do for myself. And that is exactly the way that God is with us. That's what Jesus did for us. The brokenness, the mess that we made that is too big for us. He said, as, a, as the father, I'm not going to leave it this way. And he came in. Jesus came to do what we could never do for ourselves and rescue us from our brokenness, rescue us from our sin. And John 3.16 and, and 17 are very familiar. Even if you aren't following Jesus, you may be familiar with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Right? God gave his best. Right? That's why I'm saying, listen, God said, I see you. I see the brokenness. I know you can't fix it. I'm giving my best for you. I love verse 16, but I love verse 17. I think it's just as powerful. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. When God sent Jesus, it wasn't to say, why can't you do this? Look, I did it. Why can't you do it? And condemn us in our brokenness and say, fix it. You made the mess. Clean it up. That's not the approach. No, he didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. To say, listen, I know you can't. I'm going to do what you could never do yourself. I'm going to save you from your brokenness. I'm going to give you a way of escape out of the brokenness that you find yourself in. 
the big theme that we'll see throughout the book of Malachi is this, God's love for his people despite their brokenness. God's love, even in the midst of, of some really broken, messed up stuff, God's love is consistent. And so the big idea, when we say God gave his best so we should give our best, what we really mean is this, because God gave his best for us, he gave us Jesus, he is worthy of our honor, of our worship, of our best. It's not something we earn, but it's something we worship. It's something we say, God, thank you. It's a sense of honor and devotion. And saying, God, I'm so thankful for how you rescued me. And that's why we give him our best, because he wants our heart. He wants our heart. Wants us to be close in relationship with him. Let's take out our Discover cards. And maybe today, you, you've been trying to pay back God. Time and again, you trying to do things to earn his love, his salvation. But here's the beautiful fact, the beautiful, amazing truth that doesn't sound like it is, but it is. Rest in the fact that you will never be good enough. You will never be good enough. But Jesus is. He's more than enough. And if you will put your faith and your trust in him and what he accomplished for you and me and and his ability to, to follow God perfectly, you can be saved. You can be rescued from your brokenness, the mess that you find yourself in. And if that's you to say, man, I need to be rescued, would you check that first box, become a follower of Jesus? And I want to pray for you in a minute, but would you tell someone, if you're making that decision today, would you talk to me or or maybe a community group leader, someone you, you came with today, someone who invited you? We want to be able to celebrate that with you. The second next step there, I've offered God leftovers in. Are there areas where you know God is not getting your best? And it's not a sense of trying to pay him back, but a sense of, I, there's areas of my heart, I am not trusting Jesus. I am not giving my best to him. I'm not ascribing the value to him. Maybe it's in relationships, it's in your time, it's, it's in your finances, maybe how you serve, your gifts. I've offered God leftovers in, fill in the blank, whatever that is. And then on the flip side of that, I will honor God in Where? Where do you need to learn to trust God more? To honor him with your best? Maybe there's areas that scare you to death to begin to give God your best in. Because you're just not sure that if you gave your best to him that there would be enough for anything else. Give your best. He's worthy of it. And finally, would you memorize 1 Corinthians 10.31 which says this. We looked at it earlier. Whether you So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much that you are more than enough. Jesus, your best was better than anything I could ever offer, and you gave your best freely for me. So God, today for those that have said, I've tried and tried and tried, and I just can't do it. I am in a place of discouragement trying to live up to, to be worthy of Jesus, what you've done, will we rest in the fact today that if we put our faith and our trust in you, Jesus, you've already accomplished it. You can do what we could never do for ourselves. So we give you our lives today. And Lord, for those areas where we have given you leftovers or areas we know we're not giving you anything at all, we need to begin, begin to give you our best. Would you help us to honor you and, and see it not about action, but it's about our heart. It's about honor. And honors about our heart. We want to bring our best to you. We want to ascribe the most value to you, Jesus, because you are worthy of it. So we give you our best today. In Jesus' name, amen.